Coming up in this episode of Finding Common Ground. And then I started thinking about, okay, if you really want to take it to extreme of isolation, think of what the ultimate punishment is for a prisoner. Put them in isolation. Five of the top 10 leading causes of death in our country are associated with adverse childhood experiences, depression, heart disease, cancer, diabetes, kidney disease. All of those things are correlated. There are two sides to every coin. How do we deal with racial issues when they affect relationships? Finding common ground on all those issues that we come against. There's black and there's white. And I think as Christians, we have to learn how to get together because we're not in heaven. I've met more interesting people just by God just bringing them in. Republicans and Democrats. But a lot of times when it comes to race and it comes to culture and it comes to perception, even as Christians, we don't always understand. We look at it through our lenses. There's Bill. I grew up in a suburb of Cleveland called Parma. Uh, Any was the, black people in Parma? There was not one. Not one black person, not Bill? Not one. Come not on, Bill, one. you got to have one, a, a nope. token black person, a token. And black there's Odell. I grew up in Charleston, South Carolina, public housing, single mom, divorced single mom with four kids, and I came up through segregation and all that kind of stuff. If a black person drove through the town, the police would stop and escort them out. Bill and Odell are finding common ground. A part of what we have to do is listen to each other, find the common ground, and question, not questioning you like you're on a witness stand, but questioning you for a better understanding. Dear Heavenly Father, just uh, thank you for this day, this beautiful day that we have out there. Thank you for bringing people into my life that care about youth as much as I care. Lord, uh, you know when you were on this earth, you talked about the youth and how important they are. And Lord, uh, thank you for giving me a heart for that. Thank you for giving me opportunities to serve the youth of America. And uh, now bless this podcast as we talk about youth issues. Amen. Lord, thank you for allowing me to be here today. Odell is not with us today, but he is here in in love and spirit. And I appreciate you allowing me to step in and try to fill his, his big shoes. I, I don't know if I'll do it, but Lord, give me the strength to try my best and to do a good job here with Bill as we find common ground. Amen. Lord, thank you for the opportunity to be here today with Bill and Jim to raise awareness about what works to keep kids healthy and safe and thriving, and for the opportunity to lead an organization like Prevent Child Abuse North Carolina that has the opportunity to have an impact on the health, well-being, and prosperity of so many people across North Carolina. Amen. 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 Sharon and Jim, welcome to the show. Jim's my co-host today, which is great. And Sharon's our guest. I thought maybe the first step we should do is let Jim introduce himself and then introduce you, Sharon, and uh, give a little background. And then uh, we've got a couple topics we want to talk about. The Youth Resilience Summit that's coming up November 16th. November 16th. 8.30 in the morning till 1.30 in the afternoon. Just around the corner. Yeah. And we're going to feed you if you show up. So that's a good thing. Hey, we're going to feed you two meals, breakfast and lunch. Wow. Okay. Diets after that, I guess. That's right. <laughs> Very good. Well, go ahead, Jim. Introduce yourself. Yeah, Bill. Thank you so much for having me here. Odell, you wish you could have been here today, but I'm happy to step in as a co-host and hopefully I'll do a good job. My name is James Allegretto and I am the director for Youth of North Carolina. I'm proud to be able to you know, work with you and Odellville, and uh, we're going to have a great time. Youth in North Carolina helps to minimize adverse childhood experiences and build resiliency in our youth, and we do that by collaborating with youth organizations from around the state of North Carolina. Bill, did you know that there are over 1,700 youth-serving organizations in North Carolina? Wow. When you say youth-serving, that includes like soccer and football and yeah, as well yeah, as the Boy Scouts 4-H. Wow. That does not include health organizations as well as government programs. And church youth groups it would include and it stuff would, like would that? would include that, yeah. Wow. A lot of youth-serving organizations around the state. Wow. I didn't know that. 1,700. 1,700. So, over 1,700. So we're one of 1,700. We are. Wow. Now, would Sharon's organization, Prevent Child Abuse North Carolina, be considered one? Absolutely. Wow. And we're, we're lucky to have uh, Sharon Hirsch with us today. She will be a presenter at the Youth Resilience Summit, which we'll get to in a little bit. You know, Sharon is a health and human services leader with a passion for telling stories that move people to take action for the greater good. And we need more of that. Oh, boy, do we. We need a lot more of that. 
our youth have struggled. You know, they're coming out of COVID. As I was on the school board, we saw some of the issues that uh, that you wouldn't think would be an issue, but are. And a lot of them are related to socialization, how to work with other people, how to not get stressed out when there's a lot of things going on. Those mental health factors also then transmitted into the school teachers because they had to deal with some of this. So we were brought up, hey, just suck it up, buttercup. No, that's not how we do it today. Today, we've got to get them to talk about their feelings, talk about what's going on, not keep it in and get angry. Because when you do that, you go down a lot of mental health problems. And, you know, today there was that uh, guy in Maine that has killed a number of people, like 15 or 16 people, wounded 70. I suspect he had ACEs. Adverse child I, I would experience. I, yeah. I would assume so. Yeah. Well, go ahead and uh, let's get Sharon to come in. Tell us about you, Jim. You didn't say anything about you. Well, I, that's uh, enough. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I've, I've been in the construction industry for many, many years. And then uh, I left the construction industry to go work for the Boy Scouts of America and had a great time impacting people through the, the Boy Scout program. Now I'm working as the director for Youth of North Carolina. And I'm able to work with a larger number of youth serving organizations. And I love that. I, I grew up on Long Island and I met a lot of people there that, you know, were suffering from ACEs. I went, I went to school with them and, you know, met them, but it really stuck out when, you know, I was working in the, in the construction industry and, you know, people would come and they would, you know, be looking for a job. They would work their week. On Friday, they'd go out, buy a guitar, whatever would happen. And, you know, by Wednesday, they're, they're hawking that guitar. And many people, they, they work so hard. And then, you know, they would just be broke. And, you know, I would say to myself, you know, what's happening in these people's lives that, you know, make this happen? Yeah. You know, how are they struggling so much? And that now, it's been years since I've worked in the construction industry. And, you know, I'm going to a lot of funerals. Wow. You know, Gordon Fortner is one young man that I worked with. And he was... You know, he was 17 years old and, you know, here he was the, this last past spring. He was, you know, he, he passed away. And I look back at his childhood and it was, you know, single family, single parent family. They never had, you know, much as far as resources in and out of, you know, trouble with the law. They had, you know, drug addiction in their house. There was, you know, mental health concerns. And to me, Gordon Fortner died of adverse childhood experiences. Wow. That's tough stuff. That's tough stuff. Yeah. Well, Sharon, Jim did a little introduction about you. Why don't you tell us about your organization and what you do sure. for a living? Sure. Well, I serve as the president and CEO at Prevent Child Abuse North Carolina. Um, today happens to be my eighth anniversary. So I'm really grateful for the opportunity to work with just an incredible team of folks that are just brilliant and talented and committed both on our staff and on our board. Our work is really focused on primary prevention of abuse and neglect. Often when people hear our name, they think that we're the agency that you call if you want to report an allegation of abuse and neglect, but that's not who we are. We are really focused upstream and trying to prevent kids from ever getting any exposure to our child welfare system. We want to make sure children grow up in safe, stable, nurturing relationships and environments. Our North Star is that all children and families are living a purposeful and happy life with hope for the future. It's what we want for everybody. And we know that it takes a lot of work to make sure that the systems and supports, environments, and relationships that children and families have are positive. And so we're about nurturing positive childhoods for all children across the state. And we do that in three key ways. We raise awareness about what works to keep kids healthy and safe from the start. We equip professionals all across the state to build protective factors, to deliver evidence-based programs, and to um, focus on the positive connections and resilience that we know kids and families particularly need. And we advocate for policies and investments that we know strengthen families from the start. So things that we talk about a lot are things like paid family leave and other family-friendly workplace policies the need for economic supports for families, and the need to prevent child sexual abuse from ever happening. Excellent. And I understand that you have uh, online classes that people can take free of charge. Can you describe us? Well, first off, let's give your website so that people can go to your website. Sure. It's preventchildabusenc.org. There you go. Preventchildabusenc.org. And when they get there, there, there are some tools that they can use. 
and uh, as well as uh, educational materials. Can you describe that a little? Sure. We have a number of toolkits that folks can use. We actually encourage our network of agencies to use those toolkits and anybody in the general public to raise awareness. We particularly have a number of tools under our page around Connections Matter NC. That's a, an initiative that is focused on preventing adverse childhood experiences and promoting the positive relationship of connections for building children's brains. We know relationships are the biggest builders of children's brains, and they're the greatest healer of trauma for those of us that have experienced any adversity. And so we have training and, and an ability to connect to our staff to come and others that we have trained across the state to provide training to individuals and organizations. And we have social media toolkits that are there to help organizations spread the message through social media. We also have a whole page dedicated to Connections Matter congregations for congregations, faith communities all across the state to think about how they can support and strengthen families from the start. We also have toolkits for Child Abuse Prevention Month, for the Kids First license plate, and a number of other social media campaigns. We also have training that's available for free on the website. We have one that's called What is Prevention that helps folks understand what primary prevention is all about. And we have one on how to recognize and respond to child maltreatment, including how to make a report. In the next year, we'll be developing some training that we think is really important to balance that mandatory reporting training, to talk more about what we can do to support families from the start so that we're not adding more children to the child welfare system, particularly for reasons related to poverty, so that we can help families get connected to the supports and resources in their community so that they're not connected to child welfare. No, that's terrific. I think, you know, I'd like to get in. I know Jim's got a bunch of questions, but uh, one of them I want to ask, and I'm going to turn it over to Jim. Explain ACEs and why it's important, and how do we know if someone has ACEs? Well, sure. Adverse childhood experiences were first identified by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, along with Kaiser Permanente, almost 30 years ago now. And ACEs are adverse experiences that happen to us in childhood. A lot of six of the, the 10 adverse childhood experiences in the first study are related to child abuse and neglect, physical, emotional, sexual abuse and neglect. Also, separation of children from their families, whether through the death of a parent, divorce, or foster care. Entering foster care is actually an adverse childhood experience. Or substance abuse or mental health issues in the home are the major adverse childhood experiences. And we know that there's a dose-response relationship between the number of adverse experiences in childhood and poor health outcomes over the lifespan. ACEs are most commonly measured in adults. It's more difficult to think about ACEs as something that we would use to diagnose things in childhood. It's important to understand more in, in adults and fostering those positive childhood experiences. But we know people who've had multiple ACEs are more likely to develop five of the top 10 leading causes of death in our country are associated with adverse childhood experiences, depression, heart disease, cancer, diabetes, kidney disease, all of those things are correlated to what happens to us in childhood. We know that that adversity fosters toxic stress when it happens over and over again, and that that toxic stress impacts the way children's brains develop. It hyper develops fight or flight and freeze responses in what we call our downstairs brain. And it minimizes our executive functioning when we experience too much adversity. It also literally gets under our skin and impacts our immune systems and the way that cortisol and other factors within our bodies develop so that that's why we say what happens to us in childhood lasts a lifetime. And it's important that we work to both make sure that those things never happen in the first place and that we minimize the impact with positive childhood experiences, positive connections, and the presence of, of a single caring adult in a child's life can make all the difference. Very good. Very so Sharon, good. Jim, go ahead. Yeah. So if somebody is suffering from adverse child experiences, is this a death sentence for them? Absolutely not. That's why we focus on raising awareness about positive childhood experiences. When folks have those positive connections with someone and have positive experiences that can buffer the impact, we also have lots of therapy and interventions that we now know work and can make a difference. 
things that range from meditation practices in our schools and all the way through more intensive therapy. We know that that makes a difference and ACEs are never a death sentence, but it's really, really important that they get addressed. I would think that public awareness and education is really, really important in your line of work. Yes, absolutely. And that's why our Connection Spatter campaign is so important and having the opportunity to work with an agency like yours and on this podcast are ways that we work to raise awareness and get the word out to lots of different sectors. A lot of us that are in the child serving and prevention field have been talking about adverse childhood experiences for more than 25 years now. But we still find that the business community doesn't know much about this. It's important to talk to faith communities about this. Really, we know everyone has a role to play in helping our children live those purposeful and happy lives. And everyone has a role to play in helping to make sure that that happens. Yeah, Sharon, you, you're absolutely right. You know, there was um, a time recently I took my kids to their pediatrician and you know, and I asked the doctor, I said, what do you know about adverse childhood experiences or ACEs? And the doctor didn't really know about that. And this is somebody who's in the medical field. And you would think you would think that this would be something that every doctor would know about or study or understand. You would. I've been to pediatric grand rounds at UNC a number of years ago and to talk about the ACEs study. And when I started the talk, I said, I wanted to make sure I understood who understood about ACEs. And only three people raised their hands and said that they'd even heard of the study. It's part of the advocacy work that we do both at Prevent Child Abuse North Carolina and through our national network. Um, We work a lot with the North Carolina Pediatric Society here to raise awareness, but all medical professionals should know about the ACEs study because it's often at the root of why different diseases are showing up in doctor's offices. We use the quote from Desmond Tutu, who said that there comes a point where we need to stop just pulling people out of the river. We need to go upstream and find out why they're falling in. And if we continue to just treat symptoms and not get at the root cause, we're going to continue to have these problems over and over again. That's why our work is so focused on primary prevention so that we have fewer children falling in the river. I love that. I love your upstream approach. If somebody's listening, what are like three things that they can do at home? Let's say they know nothing about adverse childhood experiences. They know nothing about Prevent Child Abuse in North Carolina. They know nothing about the Youth Resilience Summit, which we'll get to in just a few moments. But let's say they know nothing about it, but they want to make a difference and they want to start identifying some of these things. What are some things that they can do themselves to get involved? Um, I would say there there are a couple of things. One is to learn more about how you can focus on developing positive relationships with kids and families. If you're a member of a congregation, make sure that you're you're connecting with young families, parents with young children and offering support and resources anytime that we are helping to foster those positive connections and relationships, we're going to make a difference. And when we think about concrete supports, concrete supports in times of need are a protective factor that's proven to prevent abuse and neglect. So anytime someone is donating food to a a food pantry or the food bank, donating clothes to a clothing closet, donating diapers to the diaper bank, those things all prevent child maltreatment and foster positive childhoods. So doing those kinds of things, mentoring a child, being a part of a boys and girls clubs or big brothers and big sisters is a way to help and donating to agencies that support families. Those three things are simple and easy things that anyone can do. You know, and what it comes down to is I think thinking about other people. You know, Bill mentioned earlier that we came out of COVID and, you know, mental health is a huge issue now. And, you know, I find working in the school system and I find working with, you know, scouting and other youth organizations that right now kids are kind of just thinking of themselves. And I can give a really quick and easy example of that. You know, my, my daughter, she's in school and the teacher has just a handful of calculators and my daughter needs a calculator to complete her math work. And the, you know, the teacher said, come up and, you know, get a calculator. And, you know, and everybody went up there, whoever went up there, grabbed calculators and the last calculator was taken and she did not get one. You know, she asked somebody, she's like, do you really need that calculator? And, you know, he said, no, but I'm going to hold on to it anyway. And you know, in my head, I would think, 
no, if you if you need it, you take it. And if I need it, I'll ask you for it back. But we just don't see that now. You know, people are just, you know, kind of thinking of themselves. And I think if we spend a little time trying to think about our neighbors, trying to think about the other person, I think it could, you know, help a lot of this. Uh, if you're at the grocery store, grab an extra, you know, can of green beans and donate it or, you know, a, a package of diapers. Diapers are expensive, you know, for families that need that. Absolutely. We need to develop a stronger sense of community. That's what we talk about a lot in Connections Matter. A lot of our society is, you know, we have we have some strong core values in our country and community is one of them. And conversely, so is rugged individualism and pulling ourselves up by our bootstraps. It's really hard for children to pull themselves up by their bootstraps. Children can't live on their own. And often we don't think about these issues through that lens. Um, no one raises their children all by themselves. And having that sense of community and support for one another is really the key and the most important thing. It undergirds everything that we talk about. We need to understand that we're all in this together and be thinking about the common good because we're not going to be successful on our own ever because we all rely on other people and other systems, other organizations to help us be successful, whether it's our government building roads so that we can get to work every day, our colleagues in the workplace, our faith communities, our neighborhoods. And I think a combination of being so physically distant during the pandemic, the messaging during that time was about social distancing, we kept saying physically distant, socially connected it was really, really important. We are social beings by nature. We have got to be connected to one another. And folks are so attached to their phones. You know, there's so much focus on how things appear, how many likes and clicks and friends folks have on social media sites has become more important for a lot of our children than the relationships that they have in real life. Often you see, I see kids sometimes that are together and they're on their phones talking to each other and texting rather than actually talking to one another. <laughs> We've got to bring those kinds of things back for our kids because that's that's how our brains are wired. We're wired for connection. You know, I love this uh, at the Prevent Child Abuse NC.org website, the Community Planning Toolkit. Mm -hmm. Great resource for anybody that really wants to do the things that we're discussing here. You just go to preventchildabusenc.org and go to the community planning toolbox, and there's a lot of resources right in there. Yeah, and they're all built on the protective factors. Um, protective factors are the five factors that we know children and families need so that children can grow up safe and healthy. And I know when you talk to our staff uh, on another one of the sessions that you're going to have on the podcast, they're going to talk in more depth about protective factors and connections matter. But those those five protective factors are really simple. It's about building kids' social and emotional skills, which is why they all not, don't need to be on their phones all the time. They need to be developing relationships with one another. It's about knowledge of parenting, positive parenting and the stages of child development. It's about social connections. It's about parental resilience and parents being able to bounce back after having a rough time themselves and having folks that they can lean on. And then it's about those concrete supports in times of need. All of those things together are what we know nurtures positive childhoods. You know, you bring up a good point because I, I was reflecting on a number of things as you were speaking. The isolation issue, you know, with every action, there's another reaction. And the action that we did to socially distance and shut down the country, one of the fallouts is what we're seeing in the schools. And uh, people just struggling with beginning to have a socialization. They haven't learned it. And then I started thinking about, okay, if you really want to take it to extreme of isolation, think of what the ultimate punishment is for a prisoner. Put them in isolation. Exactly right. That's how you punish them. I hadn't thought of that until you started talking. And then I started reflecting on my life growing up. And the thing is that when you grow up, you have a set of lenses. You just assume everybody else has grown up like you. Okay. They have loving parents. They have loving grandparents. I had 66 first cousins within walking distance. So we had a lot of socialization. We did. And, <laughs> and we would go for the weekend and eat at one aunt's house and then sleep at a different uncle's house. And, and we'd show up back Sunday. Now, the, the moms would call 
to find out was little Billy. That was me, little Billy. Was little Billy here? Yeah, he had lunch, but he went over to Uncle Burns. He's having dinner over there, I hear. So she called Uncle Burns. He goes, yep, he had dinner, but he went to Uncle Pete's. He's going to spend the night over there with his cousins. And uh, somebody would be sleeping in my bed, one of my cousins. So I just thought everybody did that. And come to find out, that's very rare. Well, it's become even more rare as we've become more of a, we migrate more. I mean, so many folks get transferred with their employers to other Mm -hmm. parts of the country um, that we're not as connected to our extended family as we used to be. I mean, I, when my children were born, my mother wasn't anywhere nearby. My father was far away. Um, It was really hard. When my daughter was born here in North Carolina, we had just moved here a year before and I didn't have that social network yet. And that's when you have a a little baby and you don't have a large social network, then you start to really understand why being connected to neighbors, friends, congregations is so important. Because you can't do it by yourself. And it's overwhelming. Being a new parent is so hard. It is. Uh, And that's one of the reasons why we work so hard to try to advance and see an expansion of programs like home visiting and parenting education across the state. Home visitors are folks that visit with women who are pregnant and help get them connected to resources and visit with the family for up to three years after a baby is born, helping with all the different milestones and understanding the stages of child development, the things that our extended families used to be able to do in our society that we've lost over the last century or so. Yeah. You know, when COVID came, you know, we're all isolated. So I'm the oldest of eight and uh, a lot of cousins and, um, we decided we were going to do a a Sunday Zoom and we would go on. And, you know, it was the first time that I really sat and listened to my siblings, what their week was like, what they were doing. And and part of it is not that I didn't care before, but when you have that many people, it's tough to sit down and focus on one person because there's so much activity. So when we did the Zoom, you know, I'd say, hey, Marty, what'd you do this week? And he talked what he did and, and, Everybody listened. And we found that, and we're still continuing that. Well, we, don't awesome. do it, yeah, we don't do it every week. We do it once a month, and we do the first Sunday of the month. And if if I don't get on, they're texting me, hey, Billy, get to get on this. From that standpoint, it's helped my family because we would do Sunday dinners and stuff. But my dad was a fireman, so he was gone every other night. My mom was a stay-at-home mom, but she never drove. So we just stayed around the house. But we didn't do a lot of socialization until uh, we do a lot more now and it might be because we've gotten older but i think covid helped us see that that it was a real benefit even though we were socializing but not to the intimate level that we do today where you know people talk about oh i'm struggling with this or i'm struggling with that so i find some benefits for covid oh absolutely we learned a lot during that process and i think that that kind of connection has been really important to a lot of folks We have found that it's made it easier for some of the agencies that we work with to support families because transportation is such a barrier for many and childcare is a barrier and access to food is a barrier. So offering parenting programs and parent support groups over Zoom has worked for a lot of communities that are more rural and more physically distant between each other that don't have public transportation. Um, yep. So there's there's innovation that comes out of adversity, too. And that's that's part of resilience, right? Mm-hmm. It's, it's about learning and growing from the adversity that you go through. Yes. Jim, throw it back to you. Sharon, this has been fantastic. I'd like to talk just a moment about the uh, Youth Resilience Summit. Please do. So Youth Resilience Summit, is a, it's an amazing, diverse program that has a networking component to it. It's probably one of the most interesting and unique conferences that you'll ever go to. And this year, it's on November 16th at NC State University. It starts at 8.30 in the morning and goes until 1.30 in the afternoon. And Sharon Hirsch is going to be one of our presenters. But not only that, she is a co-chair for the event, Bill. She's a co-chair for the event along with you know three other people. But you know, Sharon, I appreciate you being a co-chair. And I just want to know, you know, what's the value that you saw in the program to you know, sign on to be a, a co-chair for this event? Well, you know, I was part of it last year, too. And, yes, you, um, were. and uh, you know, there's always value in bringing people together that don't normally see each other to learn. One of the things that we have found across, especially since the pandemic, is a lot of child serving organizations have not been talking to one another and not connecting with one another the way that they did pre-pandemic. 
So the opportunity to bring folks together that work in different agencies to learn about the science of ACEs and positive childhood experiences, to learn about innovations that are happening across the state and to get connected to those resources is invaluable. It's an opportunity to build the capacity of other agencies that are directly serving kids and families. That's what we're all about at Prevent Child Abuse North Carolina. You know, we don't support kids and families directly. We do that work as an intermediary, building the capacity of others across the state. So anytime we have the opportunity to elevate the conversation, to raise awareness and connect folks that work directly with kids and families to more learning and connection to resources and other supports in the community, the better off more of our children and families are gonna be. We know that no one agency can do this work by itself, that it takes a lot of partnership and a lot of connections. And so when you build that capacity through a program like this for hundreds of folks at one time, that's a great benefit. So we're happy to be partners with all of you and the other folks that are part of the Youth Resilience Summit. Your organization is a great partner for Youth of North Carolina. And information on the summit can be found at youthofnc.org. Now, Sharon, your your program is about you are the key to building and preventing an ecosystem of nurture and positive childhoods. Do you want to give us a little bit about what they're going to learn in your particular presentation? Sure. I'm going to be talking about how everyone has a role to play, and I'll talk specifically to the folks that come to the session. I'm going to find out more about who they are and what kind of work they do and try to customize what I talk about based on where they work. But I want everyone that goes to understand the role that they can play and that prevention is not about foster care. It's not about CPS. It's not about making a report when you see a child that you think has been hurt. It's about going upstream and focusing more on what can I do to support a family that I can see is struggling today? What are the ways that my family and my community can support families so that all the children in my neighborhood, at my school, in my congregation can thrive? So I'll be talking about how to build those protective factors, and I'll be talking about some of the macro level things that we can all do together, like advocating for policies and investments, both in communities, at the county level and statewide that we know that if we could make those investments, that more children would be happier, thriving, and not be in our child welfare system. I don't know if you all know this right now, but our child welfare system is incredibly stressed, especially since the pandemic and with the opioid crisis. And if we could focus more time and resources on supporting families, particularly families that are being reported to child welfare for reasons of neglect that are often highly correlated to poverty, and we could address those issues. We could also take a lot of, of the overload of stress off families, which is often at the root of why abuse and neglect occurs, but we can also take the overload of stress off our child welfare system that struggles with really, really high turnover rates and too many children that are in the system and they can't find foster parents for. We want to make sure that kids never get separated from their families because we know some children and some families really do experience really awful adversity and kids do need to be separated and in foster care, but we want that to be a rare occurrence and not the first or early step that our child welfare system has to take. We wanna build a sense of community for kids and families so that child welfare involvement is, is a rare event instead of something that happens particularly for our children of color all too often. One of the statistics that keeps me up and makes me think about a lot is that more than 50% of our black and brown children in our country have some experience with our child welfare system before age 18. Wow. And, and that's not okay. So we want to make sure that we're doing all we can to support kids and families so that that's not such a common occurrence for kids. That's not normal and it's not the way it should be. Attendees of the Youth Resilience Summit on November 16th will get a great opportunity to sit in and enjoy your presentation. And it may even you know, change their narrative and the strategies of what they're currently providing, either you know, if they're working with kids or if they're volunteering with kids. You know, the Youth Resilience Summit is for anybody that has an involvement with kids or, you know, Sharon, even if they care about kids, they should attend this event. It's if, on they've ever been a kid, if they've ever been a kid, they should pretend the summit because we're all in this together. 
You're absolutely right. And the, the summit is on November 16th, and you can get more information at youthofnc.org. Now, listen, if you don't live in North Carolina, if you live somewhere across the country or the 49 other countries that are tuning in to this podcast, they can go to youthofnc.org and they can register to attend this summit in person or virtually. Via Zoom, huh? Via Zoom. Wow. You can attend the whole conference virtually if you choose to, and you can register for that at, at youthofnc.org. Now, Sharon, you can't do that because you got to speak, so you're no, nothing virtual. you got to be there. I'm, I'm happy to be there. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Very good. Well, we're going to have to end this shortly, so I'm going to give each of you, if you want to say one last thing before I close it up. So I'll, I'll start, and we'll mm-hmm. let Sharon have the, the last word. Oh, that'd be great. You know, thank you so much for allowing me to be your co-host today. And, you know, uh, I know you can't wait to get Odell back in here because <laughs> you can't really do it without him, right? So my last word of the day is, you know, it only takes one loving, caring adult to make a difference in a child's life. And is that going to be you? Thank Very you. good. Very good. And thank you all for the opportunity to talk to you and share this message. I just want to leave everyone with changing the narrative. Child maltreatment is not what the norm should be, and it is possible to nurture positive childhoods and to prevent abuse and neglect from ever happening. It's a preventable, solvable public issue, and all of us have a role to play. Very good. I guess I will take a last word. Remember, keep the main thing the main thing, and it's all about the kids. Thank you, Sharon. Thank you. See you soon. Bye-bye. Bye. Find Bill and Odell online at thecommonground.show. This podcast is a production of BG Ad Group. All rights reserved. This podcast is brought to you by Yes Weekly, the triad's largest circulated and best read weekly magazine. You can also find us online at yesweekly.com and on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Yes Weekly, your trusted news leader for local arts, entertainment, music, food, and more for nearly 18 years. Whether you're a big, medium, or small business, managing and growing the bottom line is important. Focus CFO brings the experience and financial acumen of a Fortune 100 Chief Financial Officer to your company at a fraction of the cost. PNL help, internal reporting processes, or any business transitions or events, Focus CFO will help you and your team have a CFO in your company's back pocket. Focus CFO. Learn more at focuscfo.com.